Hey bro, you at home right now? No? Well, you kinda should be, bro. You know there's a global pandemic due to a massive viral outbreak that's affected millions and killed hundreds of thousands, right bro? Listen, my man, or gal, or gender non-conforming friend, I have the answer. Video games! I don't know if you've ever heard of them, bro, but I'm gonna... <laughs> I'm gonna stop saying bro now, it's cringe. We've all been stuck inside our boring homes with our smelly family and roommates for months now. Well, those of us who are good beans who don't go out and get fucking smashed down at the pub and have a gab with their mates and cough and sneeze on each other, but most of us have been good beans. And it's hard to keep being such a good bean. You look outside, the sun is shining, the birds are singing, and you're wasting away in your room, slowly becoming more and more encased in dust particles, longing for something to take your mind off the depressing reality of the current state of the world. Bro, have I got the video games for you! After drowning in the sea of depression that was The Last of Us Part 2, I went looking for some games that were a touch more colourful and friendly and wholesome and fun for the sake of my own sanity in this depressing, inescapable pandemic. And I found a little collection of games that just put a smile on my face, pretty much from start to end. Some of these are new, some are a bit older, but all of them I think are great games to play when you're feeling down, be they because they're the most pure freaking games you'll ever find, or because they're great games to get lost in for hours on end. All of them, for one reason or another, are the perfect time wasters for the poor soul trapped in their own home. So hey, I'm Vale, or Remy, still not committed one way or the other, oops. And if you enjoy this video, then maybe consider liking and subscribe. No, I'm not going to do that. I'm not that much of a shill. I will say though, this is an attempt at a new style of format where I tackle several games at a time and instead of going in depth with all of them like I do in normal reviews, I'm just going to give a little summary, talk about stuff I like and didn't like and move on to the next game. No idea if I'll continue to do stuff like this in the future. You know my channel, it's a constantly evolving anomaly. It's like the shaky leg of the game review community. It can never sit still, it's always jumping around. Anyway, without further ado, pure wholesome games to play during a global pandemic. Let's go! I really liked my 20 or 30 hours with Animal Crossing New Horizons, but I will openly admit that I traded that in once I had my fill. I wanted something similar to it, but also not really like it at all. And the new game Littlewood, which retails on Steam for 15 bucks in the US, fills that void pretty damn well. You are the hero who cleansed the world of a great evil, and peace has spread across the land once more thanks to your unabashed heroism. But a side effect of kicking that evil's butt is that you now have amnesia. You wake up in a dilapidated old town with two of your companions from your adventure and are tasked with rebuilding it, answering the requests of any residents who choose to move in, and just generally having a pretty chill time. Like, dude, okay, this game is so chill and friendly. It's freaking crazy. Like, it's legit exactly what I needed right now. And I imagine a lot of people could really benefit from sitting back and sinking some hours into it too. It honestly knocks Animal Crossing out of the park for me, which, it, it's a bold claim, sure. But Littlewood grabbed my attention and kept it for much longer, all because of one reason. It has respect for the player's time. Animal Crossing's fun, you know, it has a lot of customization options, the characters are cute, there's a fair amount to do, but almost every single thing in that game is held back by some sort of crippling, time-wasting bullshit that only serves to inconvenience the player. You can only craft one thing at once, you can only buy turnips on a Sunday between 8am and midday because, yes, we're all awake that early on a Sunday. Terraforming was a pain in the ass. Every time you want to fly to another island, you've got to sit through boxes and boxes of dialogue, not to mention the asinine loading times everyone has to sit through whenever someone comes to your island. It's slow, it's tedious, and it made me trade in the game. In comparison, there's a whole bunch of lovely little quality of life features baked into Littlewood's design that makes sitting down and playing it for a few hours or even just a few minutes an absolute joy. Building and terraforming is a massive pain in the taint in Animal Crossing, but in Littlewood, not only can you do it right from the very first day of the game, but it pops you into a very simple to understand editor mode. Whereas crafting in Animal Crossing requires you to sit through an animation and several text boxes for every single individual item you want to make, Littlewood be like, oh yeah, if I can take your rocks to the blacksmith, press enter, oh fucking boom, iron bricks, now go in a build mode, place your thing down wherever, oh it's fucking simple mate. You can't really run out of things to do on any given day like you can in Animal Crossing because instead of running in real time, Littlewood runs off a stamina system, performing certain actions like crafting, cutting wood, picking weeds, fishing, and mining away depletes your stamina and when it gets low it's time to head to bed at which point it progresses straight to the next day i love this so much you're not stuck putting the game down until the next day like animal crossing or rushing around trying to do stuff before the day's over like in stardew valley time progresses when you want it to 
It is so unbelievably stress-free and it's the exact reason why I bought Littlewood on launch day. This feature speaks to me. In a game with so much choice and so many things to remember to do, I don't want to be told to stop for the day or to hurry up before the day ends. Time progresses on my terms because I am omniscient and all-powerful. Yes. I'ma stop nunning about the stamina system though because there's a lot of other things to love about this game. The visuals are super colourful and vibrant and the music is so relaxing. Controls are streamlined with there literally only being two buttons, one being accept slash interact and the other being menu slash cancel because that's all the game needs. Characters are pretty memorable, there's a lot less compared to Nintendo's town sim, but most of the characters you meet are very likeable. Some of them being people from your former life as a hero who will recount the many adventures you went on while others are starstruck travellers who want to get in your pants, which by the way is totally a mechanic in Littlewood. I mean, not sex, of course, but you can date all but one of the villagers and eventually even get married to them. Why, of course I got married to the handsome burb. Quite funny that everyone wanted to get into my pants, to be honest. I mean, Ren, Pogmaster of Pogville? <laughs> yeah, there's a guy you'd love to date. You can also spend time fulfilling requests for the townsfolk, like giving them specific furniture or putting their house within a certain distance of another facility. But if you don't, eh, that's fine. They don't care. They're very understanding, but if you do, they will love you and compliment you forever, which is another thing about Littlewood. Everyone always gives you compliments and tells you how much of a bang up job you've done, even when it's not directly related to them. Congrats for reaching mining level 10, here's a hundred bucks. Fucking nice job for, uh, existing, here's a DeLuca coin. Some might find this insufferable, but nah, I'm down with it. Everyone is friend is nice. Even one of the ways of passing time is giving another resident a compliment yourself, which raises their heart meter, one of many, many meters you'll be spending your time increasing. There's a meter for every resident, all your skills from farming to mining, etc, and even for each structure or facility. Upgrading them by feeding them money or materials will unlock new features for them, but you can only make one donation to each of them per day, so trying to get these upgraded along with everything else lends the game this one more day mentality to playing it, and for me at least, one more day turned into several more days. And so so on and so forth until I realised it was 6am. It does a great job at really pulling you in. Gripes I have a very few and very minor. At some point the rate at which you unlock new stuff and events like new residents moving in become less frequent and it does become a little grindy. Also build mode is mostly fine but having to drag the cursor from one end of the town to the other is like wading through a pool of molasses. And one of my main complaints while writing this script was that I felt I wouldn't have enough room to fit everything into my town but thankfully that was proven wrong when a wandering traveller offered to cut down surrounding trees for a feat. Otherwise these are my only real complaints and they all fall to the wayside when I find myself lost in the game for several hours on a rainy night, lying in bed, all snuggled up under the covers, chopping down trees and going on dates with birds. For 15 bucks, Littlewood's a no-brainer. It's perfect for short bursts of play or long multiple hour sessions and there's so much comfy content here, way more than I expected for how small the entry fee is. I guarantee you'll enjoy yourself if you're wanting a change of pace from Animal Crossing or Stardew Valley, especially since New Horizons has no dating mechanic whatsoever. I just want to smooch the lizard boy, okay? Raccoons are the greatest animal ever created. I would know, of course, I have performed many a great deed in my time. My accomplishments known across the entire globe. My prowess knowing no bounds. My infinite wisdom set to be passed down through generations, yada yada yada. Which is why Donut County sucks. They put this poor little rack fellow on blast. Look at him, he's so cute and low poly. Why would you bully such a handsome little dude? What, he swallowed up an entire town by using an app to control a hole in the ground? I don't see the issue, I would do the exact same thing. BK Raccoon works at a donut shop in the titular Donut County, delivering donuts to people who order them online. Except whoever orders a donut ends up getting a visit from Mr. Hole in the Ground and has themselves and all their stuff swallowed up and sent plunging down 999 feet below the ground. You are in direct control of that hole and all you gotta do is move the stick to position the hole under stuff so you can <laughs> Everything you <laughs> makes the hole grow bigger so you can <laughs> even larger objects. That's the basis of the entire game. All you gotta do to beat a stage is swallow everything up, kinda like an off-brand Katamari game. You'll occasionally come across a puzzle, though that deserves to go in huge quotation marks because it really doesn't take a genius to solve these things. I once sliced my finger open on a can of diced tomatoes, so case in point. Most of the puzzles are either physics based, like trying to figure out how to get access to the smaller object to make your hole bigger so you can consume the larger object, or using the catapult functionality you eventually unlock to hurl certain things you've already swallowed back into the air, or filling your hole with water or some other liquid, etc etc. It's all super easy stuff that you'll probably breeze through fairly quickly and I'm pretty sure that was the intention. 
You see, Donut County takes a grand total of two thirds of Fast and Furious Crossroads to beat. In two hours, in layman's terms, probably even shorter if you're not utterly horrible at puzzles like I am, there's around 20 levels, each of which can be beaten in mere minutes, and the rest of the game is delegated to static cutscenes, which take up a surprising amount of the game because there's a fairly decent little story here. Metal Gear Solid or The Last of Us this is not, it's nothing crazy, but there's a colourful little cast of characters, and it can be pretty funny when it wants to be. As funny as you think characters saying LOL out loud is of course, if you're not up to to date with happenings on the internet, you might have some trouble getting into it, and the reliance on net speak is probably going to age this game pretty bad in a decade or two. But here, right now, in the unholy year that is 2020, I'll openly admit, I wished. BK swallows up the tent of a local vegetable seller, and the other main character, Mira, says, don't you have something to say to him? And BK says, yeah, vegetables stink. And someone else agrees, and Mira, even though she's trying to keep her composure and be the bigger person in that situation, can't help but to just go LOL. That's the type of humour you should expect, and that's not gonna fly for everybody, but man, I had a fucking blast with this game because of how cheeky it was. I am very much one of those assholes who says LOL out loud, and yeah, nah, almost all of the jokes landed for me, and at least made me exhale from my nose. And that extends to the gameplay too. Sure, you're sending hapless townsfolk falling to their doom and generally causing unprovoked destruction, but there's still some pretty hilarious scenarios you come across in your adventures to swallow the town hall. Like getting a few rabbits to fall into the hole, then seconds later a steady stream of newly born bunnies starts spewing out. The short length and few amount of levels means that they could just go wild with several different concepts that are just different enough and don't get repeated. At least until the final level, which in and of itself is kind of funny because they somehow managed to cram a boss battle into this game about controlling a hole. It's pretty nuts. D donuts. <clears throat> Heck, they even went that extra little step and gave every unique item that falls into your hole a unique and humorous description. 99% of seagulls are criminals. The human ear can hear over 100 songs. A live spaghetti. A live spaghetti with the ability to hate. I would switch bodies with a cactus, no questions asked? Huh? Is, is this a raccoon thing? Are we supposed to like cacti? What the fuck? People always said I was a prick, but this is ridiculous. I've made a very grievous error, help me. In terms of negative stuff, again, not a whole lot. Sometimes it can take a bit of fiddling to get stuff into the hole, phrasing. There were a couple times where I thought I was doing something wrong, but no, the object I was trying to swallow was just refusing to cooperate. The final part of the game at Raccoon HQ also takes up a fair chunk of the game and it does feel a bit repetitive being here for around a third of the runtime, especially considering this is the part where they start reusing concepts you've played with before. And I really do wish it was a little bit longer. I enjoyed the concept well enough and it's kind of sad to see it end after only two hours. You can replay any level you've beaten and smash out some time trials, but otherwise what what you see here is what you get. It is only 20 bucks though, or 13 bucks across the pond, and I think that's a pretty decent price. You're paying what you would pay for a movie for a movie length experience, and it's even better if you find it on sale, which I did. Seven Aussie dollar dues that trash puppy sent me back and I enjoyed every single minute of it. It's the perfect curl up under a blanket and knock it out in one sitting game with some wonderful low poly visuals, a great soundtrack, and even some morals to learn so the littlies get something out of it. And also I'm practically obligated to buy and review any game featuring a raccoon as the main character. Seriously, I don't get this! Conveniently, I have recovered from my previous infliction so that I may freely yell about STINKY FOXES! Raccoon's greatest enemies! Nah, they're fine, they're cute. Lucky's Tale has had a bit of an adventure across platforms over the years. Originally starting out as a 3D platformer for the Oculus family of VR headsets, it made the jump to Xbox One and Windows 10 as Super Lucky's Tale, which was more or less the same thing, just without the requirement of having Facebook strapped to your face. Recently, it made the jump to Nintendo Switch as new Super Lucky's Tale. Very creative. Mmm, I wonder where they pulled that from. Mmm. An updated version of Super Lucky's Tale with quality of life improvements all across the board as well as new content, but fellas, I have to admit, with the exception of Mario 3D All-Stars, which was gifted to me, I would never buy that with my own money, I haven't touched my Switch in a long ass time. The portability was nice, but I was kind of holding out for a port to other systems, which on August 21st, I finally got my wish, with new Super Lucky's Tale coming back home to Xbox One and Windows 10, but also making the leap to PS4 as well, which is really neat. Right off the bat though, the Windows 10 port is super weird. I couldn't record the game at all with the Xbox game bar, and I couldn't record it in full screen with Shadow Play, so I had to record it in fucking windowed mode, which is a big yucky. Graphics options are super limited too. You get one slider for graphical fidelity and another option for resolution, and that's it. 
Funnily enough, while this game isn't exactly a visual powerhouse, I could not get it to run on Ultra at 1080p on my laptop. My laptop's no slouch either, it's one of those ASUS ROG Kutra Poly machines and it's got an RTX 2070 in it, and yet it can only run the game at Ultra on 720p, and even then, it wasn't exactly 60fps. It ran fine on my PC, so yeah, uh, I have no idea. Anyway, the game starts off with these really cute 2D illustrations set to narration by Lucky's older sister Lyra, who says their family of foxes, the Swifttails, is trying to protect the Book of Ages, some magical book that holds worlds inside of it or something, I don't know, from the evil kitty litter. And they're forced to constantly be on the run and hiding from them, and then something happens and Lucky gets sucked into the book, and why is the intro so serious when the game looks like this? Also, they paint the kitty litter to be this tyrannical group of cats, but then you meet them in the game and they're like the most comically inept villains you'll ever meet, so the intro is definitely at odds with the actual game, but that's fine. It's the game that counts in the end, and luckily, Nasult is a good old time. Lucky's moveset is very small, just like he is. He can jump and double jump, spin his tail for a quick three hit combo, and hold one of the triggers to burrow into the ground or slide along hard surfaces. You can also spin while in midair to extend your jump in the same vein as Jack and Daxter, and you can dive down while in the air as well. Pretty much the entirety of the game is spent with that moveset, which sounds kinda lackluster at first, but Lucky controls so damn fluidly that you probably won't mind. One of the most satisfying things is burrowing down into the dirt, then surfacing right under an enemy and jumping on them while they're stunned. And the controls are so precise and easy to master that jumping from one enemy's head to another is a cinch. While Lucky himself is fun to control, the game that revolves around his moveset, while fun in its own right, barely presents a challenge outside of the boss fights and some post-game bonus levels which low-key kinda kick ass. You can tell that this was marketed towards a younger audience, so a lot of the platforming challenges you get put up against are really easy to grasp for anyone with an age in the double digits. But for those older players, the challenge will come from hunting down the collectibles. There's four pages of the Book of Ages to be found in each level, one for beating it, one for finding 300 coins, one for completing an optional side objective hidden somewhere in the level, and one for finding all five letters that spell lucky, which is probably where most people will get hung up. Either that or I'm just really bad, because I only found all the letters in a handful of levels before I reached the end of the game. The game's pretty lenient about it though, because you only ever need a few pages to reach the next world, never any more than ten. And I'm really glad progress is gated so weakly because a lot of the pages come from these dumb fucking block pushing puzzles that you find in each world, like, I've said it before, puzzles are not my strong suit, but why are there so many block pushing levels here? There's like four or five for each world? Some of them are pretty clever I guess, but I'm playing Lucky's Tale for the platforming, not for the puzzles which make my brain do a hurdy. The game also goes for that Banjo-Kazooie style of dialogue where all the characters talk gibberish, but instead of random onomatopoeia and ikum pokum and all that, it's this weird mix of simlish and actual words that isn't really as cute or funny as it thinks it is. Shrines, herbal chew, yowza. And it's even more distracting when Lucky himself speaks proper English, despite everyone else talking in tongues. Hey, Tess! Uh, yeah, and some of these voices can start to grate on your ears real quick. Yes, please make your stereotypical farmer characters sound like Alvin and the Chipmunks characters. Gosh, what a brilliant idea! This game really do be hitting different on mute though. I'm probably being a tad harsh, but don't get me wrong, I actually really enjoy Lucky's Tale. You just kinda have to temper your expectations a bit. Don't go in expecting something as ambitious or as varied as a hat in time, I mean there is a decent bit of variation, with some levels taking on a side scrolling perspective, others being top down, there's a few auto runner levels as well, and even one or two where you get your super monkey ball on. But there's still a lot of very generic stuff here. The level theming is nothing you haven't seen before, you know, grassy fields, deserts, ruins, beaches, spooky carnivals. Even that level where you jump around on giant watermelons feels a little iterative in current year. A lot of the challenges you overcome have been done in many platformers before as well, but I honestly can't find myself caring all that much. Like, it's one thing to try and be creative and introduce all sorts of unique scenarios that haven't been seen in the genre before, but it's another thing to make a very familiar experience that doesn't break any new ground, unless you're digging into it, but does what it knows and does it well. Even though we're in a little bit of a 3D platformer revival in recent years with stuff like A Hat in Time, Ukulele, Crash 4 and upcoming indie projects such as Clive and Wrench and Billy Buster, the latter of which I have a shirt for, holy moly it's so freaking cute! Oh, 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 oh,
It's not like they're a dime a dozen like they used to be. So frankly, if you can make a good 3D platformer, even if it's not exactly revolutionary, you've immediately got my attention. And even though New Super Lucky's Tale is no Dark Souls, if you'll forgive the awful rhetoric, I thoroughly enjoyed my time with this. It's a very cozy little platformer that'll take you bugger all time to smash through it. And you can pick it up on Xbox Game Pass, which is like, what, 10 bucks a month? You'll have sleeping on the Game Pass, I'm telling you. Speaking of the Game Pass, Microsoft, listen, get Phil Spencer on the horn. I will literally marry this man if that's what it takes for me to get paid to shill out for Game Pass. Like, okay, I get that to some people, not owning the game you're playing isn't your cup of tea. But Game Pass has so many great little fucking indie titles on it, it's worth the 10 buck asking price just to get in and try some of them out. Like Carry On, Neon Abyss, The Tourist, Hypnospace Outlaw, Guacamelee 2, yet another game where you can date birds. Both the Xbox and PC versions are overflowing with spectacular independent titles and you know what? Screw it. Phil, my dude, what's up? It's Remy. The, the raccoon? Yeah, the one who called you yesterday. Listen, I wanna... No, no, listen, listen. Have you given any more thought to my proposal? No, I don't think you understand, Phil. I will do literally anything. I'll throw out my PS4 or my Switch. I, I, I will get down on my knees and su... Hello? <sighs> Fine. <laughs> Doug Bowser! Hey, my man, what's up? Mm. But yeah, earlier this year through Game Pass, I discovered a platformer called Levelhead, which I loved so much, I ended up buying straight away. On, uh, on Steam? No, 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 Phil, you don't understand. I just don't use my Xbox that much, and I wanted to support the devs directly, and, well, your storefront kind of sucks. We're sorry. The number you were trying to call has blocked you for being an incessant prick. Some of you will know that I have a huge hard-on for Mario Maker and any other game that centers itself around the concept of making, playing, and sharing levels. So when I saw Levelhead, I downloaded it and gave it a whirl almost immediately and left with a big stupid grin on my face. This is a game for those who are stuck indoors and need something to tinker with that's easy to get to grips with but has plenty, and I mean plenty, of depth under the hood. Essentially, you're an employee at the Bureau of Shipping, and you're tasked with training your very own GR18 delivery robot to adapt to any scenario it encounters while attempting to deliver goods across the galaxy. You do this by putting your adorable friend-shaped delivery dude through limited exercises for evaluating employee limitations. Um, levels. These levels range from the many dozens included with the base game to the thousands created by the community, which can be played on any version of the game no matter where the level was created, be it on Xbox One, Windows, Steam, Nintendo Switch, iOS, or Android. PS4 is an odd emission, but eh, Sony can't win them all. Our package delivering friend is very agile. They're super snappy and just plain fun to control. Whether they're bouncing on enemies' heads or getting that classic Super Mario World style run up to clear long gaps. But the central and defining mechanic is that you can't just reach the end of the level to clear it. You've got to take a package with you. You carry it around on your back so it doesn't get in the way or slow you down, but you'll also occasionally need to use it, as well as other objects, as weights to push down buttons or maybe as a makeshift platform. I sincerely hope poor GRA isn't being forced to go through the most dangerous and hazardous parts of the universe just to deliver some white girl's healing crystals or something. I mean, hell, I'd never order anything if it meant putting one of these guys through treacherous gauntlets just to get my $7 copy of Largo Winch Empire under threat for the GameCube. This concept alone, in conjunction with the various power-ups you sometimes find as well, makes the game feel super varied and rarely like you're doing the same thing level after level, opening up for some very creative level design both in the main story mode and when you jump online to browse for user-created levels. One of my favourite things is that the training mode, which is the game's main mode and not actually a tutorial, is filled with levels that feel like they were made by the community, having fun and unique mechanics but using them in interesting ways that something like Mario Maker would never dare to do. Levelhead refuses to let one concept linger for too long, always eager to introduce its next super cool idea as soon as possible. One level you're phasing through walls, the next you're slingshotting yourself all over the place, then you're slowing down time or warping yourself or other objects through portals, or getting thrown into a level where killing an enemy will kill you. The game keeps up a breakneck pace throughout, never settling for repeat its ideas too often, and when they do, they're expertly and sparingly woven into new levels alongside new concepts, many of which are incredibly creative or fun to explore, while others are a little bit familiar. Sometimes Levelhead pulls a little too much inspiration from Mario, from things like Thwomps to Koopa Troopers to the spinny fire column thingies, but it's pretty forgivable when it's lumped in with all the other creative stuff Levelhead has to offer. And all of it is yours to use as you see fit in the workshop. 
Once you've been through the main part of the game and you've racked up a few ideas, you can dive headfirst into the level editor and start building the level of your dreams with piss all effort. I set out to make a level where you would need to collect a predetermined number of gems and kill a certain number of enemies to unlock doors that block your progress, but there would be secrets and alternate pathways you could take to make the gem collecting process a bit faster, as well as bypassing some of the enemies you need to defeat as a reward for those willing to explore. And it took me a total of one hour of building, playtesting and tweaking to make something that I was pretty happy with. You can only use predetermined words to form the name of your level though, which is somewhat annoying, and I was too lazy to scroll through and find words I liked, so I just called it... Is. Mm-hmm, there it is. Uh, there is, is. Off you go, little fella. Ah, they grow up so fast. But yeah, you can find my level along with the thousands published by other players in marketing. And if the developers like your level, it'll get added to a weekly challenge called The Tower, where you blast through a few levels and try to place on a leaderboard. If that's too much for you and you just want to chill and play some levels, eh, that's fine too. The game does a wonderful job with curating the best levels it can find, and I have had a lot less crappy short meme levels show up than I have playing Mario Maker. None of that auto Mario bullshit, thank you very much. Having said that, there definitely is a little less to work with here in comparison to the competition. Levelhead has some cool stuff like switches and gates, and it's easy to do things like make certain objects appear by pressing a switch if you assign the switch and the objects to the same channel, for instance. But there aren't nearly as many enemies or level themes to work with, so there's a teensy weensy little tinge of familiarity to most of the levels you'll play. Also, it'll kick your ass if you're not ready. It gets challenging pretty quickly, but the latter half of the training mode especially is going to test you. Beneath its cutesy exterior is a very demanding platformer, and you will be watching your adorable robot friend die a lot, which is kinda cruel, but okay. Also, you'll either love or hate the cutscenes, which are framed as instructional videos narrated by Chris Pratt doing his worst Chris Pratt impression. But how do you make a robot sneaky? Our brilliant board of directors sought the answer to that question, and so enrolled the entire engineering department in the newest night class in bot education. Botany. And an overly enthusiastic Australian woman. Actually, no, almost all Australian women sound like this. If you rub your hand across a flapjack's belly, the friction creates a horrible balloon squeal, which is great for startling engineers. Sometimes it's funny and charming, but you can definitely tell they tried a little too hard with some of the writing here. Your goods deliver real good. Oh, my freaking ears. But nonetheless, Levelhead is extremely underrated. For a game so cleverly designed, so full of charm, and with such a great level editor, I don't see anyone ever talking about it, and that makes me sad, because it really could have been one of those indie cult hits if it had garnered that little bit more attention that it so clearly deserves. No lie, it's probably in this raccoon's list for game of the year. Whether it actually would be my game of the year is debatable, there's a lot of great stuff that's come out in 2020 so far that I've really enjoyed, like Doom Eternal, uh, Dreams, um... Yeah, I don't, I don't play a lot of new games. I'm, I'm still catching up with last year. Okay, I'm still playing Rock Band 3. Happy? Now, if you're looking for something with an editor that's less about an adorable robot risking its life to deliver your Yeezys and is a bit more open-ended, then Media Molecule has you covered. You might remember these guys back in the heyday of the PlayStation 3 era for bringing this adorable sack of love and joy to life. Yeah, remember Little Big Planet? I miss it. I miss it a lot. I mean, to be honest, I actually don't find the platforming to be all that good, but the tools on offer in the game's level editor were, at the time, totally unmatched. It was so incredibly deep and complicated, but still easy enough to get to grips with that any single single brain cell child could probably work it out. I spent months with it, trying to create a series of levels where the goal was to travel across the globe to defeat my, um, evil librarian. It was glitchy as fuck, but you know, that's neither here nor there. <laughs> While the first two games, as well as the PSP and PS Vita versions were excellent, we don't talk about Little Big Planet carding around here, the third main entry was developed by Sumo Digital, known for developing portable versions of mid-2000s racing games and eventually the admittedly very good Sonic racing games. I can't judge the third entry because I haven't played it properly, but oh man, it did not go over well with the fans at all. Sumo Digital is trying their hand at a 3D Little Big Planet spin-off for the PS5, which sounds right as heck. I've always wanted a 3D platformer with a level editor and this is basically my dream come- yeah, it doesn't have one. 
But luckily Media Molecule is still kicking, and after years of development, their big passion project Dreams released earlier this year, and it's almost everything I've ever wanted. While Little Big Planet was a 2.5D platformer first and foremost, Dreams isn't limited to any one genre. You could be fooled into thinking that it's a 3D platformer primarily, but diving into the Dreamiverse and browsing other players' creations reveals just how much power you have with the game's creation tools. One minute you could be playing a Bejeweled clone, the next you're playing a racing game while dodging debris during an earthquake. You might find yourself playing as an adorable kaiju monster smashing up a city and Dr. Octagonopussing the hell out of the place, or playing one of the many attempts at a first-person shooter. Admittedly, they are mixed in with a bunch of fairly generic and often very buggy attempts at platformers, but you'll find something pretty damn good if you search deep enough. I like it, Kaji. While Dreams is touted as a game-making engine, it doesn't have to be used just for making games either. Dreams also tries to push the idea of creating something that isn't strictly player-controlled. Sometimes you'll stumble across a non-interactive landscape or an animation showcase that in some cases are made to show off the kind of things you can achieve with the game's tools, while other times it's just done to look super fucking cool. Mmm, egg. You could theoretically make a whole movie in Dreams, with a composed soundtrack and voice acting and everything. And yes, you can compose your own music in Dreams as well. You can use a standard piano roll to place pre-made sounds or create the sound yourself. Or you can just slap record and hit buttons on your controller to start making the magic happen. Try playing that in Clone Hero aside. That's why Dreams is so goddamn amazing though. You have all these amazing tools and an engine with practically no limits aside from the ones the hardware itself proposes, in a consumer level product that you can go down to Big W and pick up for 50 bucks Australian. Sure, Unity and Unreal and all that are readily available, but how many people really want to dedicate themselves to learning how to code? I know I sure as hell don't, I mean it would be cool if I could make a game about me jumping around and collecting stuff, but thanks to Dreams I can do that myself on a PlayStation 4 with a regular ass DualShock controller. See? Looks just like me. Right down to the face that detaches itself from my head when I move. Okay, so fair play, Dreams isn't that easy to get into. It'll do its absolute best to ease you in with dozens of fun little tutorials, and while it is fairly intuitive once you get the hang of it, it still takes a bit of wrapping your head around it. There are a lot of controls and shortcuts to keep track of, and personally, I would kill for keyboard and mouse support. The DualShock 4 works fine, as do the Move controllers if you have access to those, in fact those are much better for sculpting objects, but by default the cursor is controlled via motion sensor, and while you can set it to the left stick, it still doesn't feel all that great. But it's still so easy to scope into the brains of an object and tweak every little individual setting from colour to collision to jump height to whatever the hell you can think of. Want to change how the sky looks? Just drag this thing in, tweak a couple of things and you've got yourself a real pretty looking skybox. Want to make your character dab? Drag in a keyframe, attach it to the corresponding button, do a little bit of posing, boom! You can now press circle to dab! Some things are impressively simple and others are going to take a bit of thinking, but the level of intuitiveness is absolutely insane. And honestly, with how much some of us are stuck inside with nothing but our own horrifying pessimistic thoughts, this is probably the best time to get learning. Anyway, for the heck of it, here's some game recommendations. I mentioned Tectonic before. It's that racing game where the track changes due to a sudden earthquake, reminiscent of Split Second and Motorstorm Apocalypse. But it has surprisingly decent physics, and I have to admit, I did make a pog face at a couple points. Dog's Run is a cute little platformer where you play as the creator's dog and you collect coins and bones and stuff, and it's pretty good. But the sequel is even better because it actually controls so gosh dang well. And you have a little spirit thing that attacks enemies and long jumps are satisfying as fuck and you can upgrade your house and lie down in your own little dog bed and ah, it's so pure. Also, you can find a shelf in a garage in the first game, which I made, uwu. Ethan Goes to Work is probably my favourite so far, not because of the gameplay, in fact the combat is unashamedly simple, but it's really impressive how seamlessly gameplay and cutscenes are woven together. I was actually really gosh dang impressed with it. It's also pretty funny, won't lie. Ay Dios mío, ese es mi planeta. ¿Qué le están haciendo? And of course, there's the fantastic dream that comes bundled with the game, Art's Dream, which weaves in and out of different genres while telling the story of a washed up, cranky jazz musician who wants to make amends with his former bandmates. It ends with this amazing jazz piece, the visual accompaniment of which, along with everything that preceded it, was made entirely with the same tools you have access to. If you've got three hours to kill, I can't recommend it enough. Time moves slow when you came to the end. 
If you want to get dreams just to play some of the creations, do be aware that a lot of the dreams you stumble across probably won't hold your attention for very long, and few of them are up to the same level of quality as most games you can buy off the PlayStation Store. I think SkillUp's review of dreams put it best when he compared browsing all the different dreams to browsing the recommended tab of YouTube. Pick something, play slash watch it for a bit, and move on to the next thing. Whether that be a full-blown attempt at a game, a recreation of an already existing property, or one of the many memes you'll inevitably stumble across. Jumping in and out of different experiences so rapidly is enjoyable in and of itself, but I do await the day where I can load up dreams, pick a creation, sit back, immerse myself in it for a good while, and go, yes, I, the average consumer, would buy that if it were real. And unfortunately, we're not quite at that point yet. But game development is a long, tiring, and strenuous process, even in something as immediately accessible as dreams. So we just gotta wait a little longer for that something special to be made. But when it does, it'll totally be worth it. There's a lot of games I considered for this video that I couldn't fit in or find the words to discuss in depth, so fuck it, honorable mentions time. Forza Horizon 4, my go-to stress reliever, in particular because it's got a neat little root creator and a metric shit ton of cars to drive. I think it's a very flawed game, and I would recommend Horizon 3 over it in many areas, but it's also been delisted from the Microsoft Store as of the end of September, so it's a little harder to find. Either game is good though. Tetris Effect, playing this game normally is great, playing it in VR is an absolute sensory overload in the best possible way. I'm horrible at Tetris, but even then, I love surrounding myself in the dreamlike landscapes with that fucking fantastic soundtrack dancing in my ears. I don't know how Tetris ended up being one of the best VR games, but here we are. Persona 4 Golden and Persona 5 or Persona 5 Royal. Have you not played Persona yet? Why the fuck have you not played Persona yet? You're stuck at home, now's the best time to invest in a 60 to 100 hour RPG about teenagers doing things. And if you don't date Arn, you're incorrect. Fall Guys. Fuck you, perfect match. Fuck you, you awful, boring-ass piece of shit! Ah! Also, the Yakuza games. I haven't finished a single one yet, but I'm partway through Zero, and I would die for this man. This video is getting way longer than I intended to, and I promise I'm gonna wrap it up soon, but there's one last game I wanna talk about before I get out of your hair and recede back into my room to consume homebrand corn chips and try to decipher what the fuck the Umbrella Academy is actually about. It's a little game called Spiritfarer. Ever since I saw it revealed at, uh, I believe it was E3 in 2019, I was smitten. It had this gorgeous hand-drawn aesthetic, a beautiful soundtrack, and the promise of feels. I love feels. So naturally, when it came to the Xbox Game Pass back in August, I jumped straight into it. I swear to fucking God, Phil, sponsor me, you overhyping bitch! Anyway, Spiritfarer is a mix of a couple different genres. It's primarily a management sim where you have to keep track of several different characters at once and tend to their needs, but it's also an adventure game with Metroidvania elements, side quests, looking for resources by mining and fishing and whatever else. It sounds like a bit of an ambitious but misguided mess, but it works way better than you would initially think. This is Stella. That's you! Wow, I'm actually kinda jealous, you're sort of adorable. And you get a cool cat named Daffodil! Now I'm double jealous, what the fuck man? Anyway, you're Stella, the new spirit pharaoh, tasked with finding deceased spirits all over the world and caring for them, making their final moments as pleasurable as possible, and helping them find clarity and solace within themselves before you ferry them to the afterlife. You do this by initially finding the wayward spirits somewhere out in the world and performing some sort of task for them to get them to join you on your ferry. Once they're accompanying you, you need to keep them happy by fulfilling the request they give you, which sometimes is nothing more than throwing a bucket of chicken or a cup of coffee at their grubby little face, to taking them halfway across the map on a soul-searching endeavour. All the while you'll be doing other things along the way, from tackling jellyfish head-on to mining away, to sawing sheep in half, to literally catching lightning in a bottle all for the sake of collecting resources and glims to upgrade your ship and the facilities you build on it. Shit gets more crowded than my shelf in the pantry whenever Blue Heaven Aeroplane Jelly goes on sale, with homes and facilities stacked on top of each other like some demented game of Tetris meets the overcrowded suburbs of a third world country. So you've got to keep upgrading your ship to fit all your poor lost lambs, both figuratively and literally. The game very quickly settles into a loop that can be pretty fun, but also a bit repetitive. So I'd suggest playing the game in moderation unless you find yourself absolutely gripped, which I did, but I found I really had to put the game down for a bit after a certain point. See, the people who join you on your voyage, they're all fantastic characters. Some more so than others, but still, you'll find yourself growing attached to them pretty quickly. They're all too eager to share stories of their past life, and you'll be able to paint a pretty clear picture of who they are and what they're like in your head. 
from the most enjoyable parts of their life to the parts they regret the most. You'll feed them their favourite dishes, you'll chat with them, you'll give them a big old hug from time to time, there is literally an option to hug your friends in this game, oh my fucking god I am going to squeal. And even as they reminisce about the best and worst parts of their former lives, you'll still laugh along with them and find joy in making them happy. It's such a cute, wholesome game and I had a big old smile on my face pretty much all the time. Right up until I had to say goodbye. Spiritfarer cruelly forces you to get to know these wonderful characters and then give them a final hug as they come to terms with the fact that their life is over, whether they manage to wrap everything that they wanted to up or not, and then they pass on before you get a brief visual glimpse of their former life. I was expecting feels. I wasn't expecting to actually cry. And I did, I'll openly admit that I kinda sobbed a bit. People are going to experience these moments in the game a little differently, and that's very true in my case, considering I lost my mother four months ago and still haven't quite moved on. I still think about her a lot, the life that she deserved to live but couldn't, all the things I wanted to say to her that I can't anymore. And because of that, this scene fucked me up. I had to put the controller down and walk away for half an hour. It really didn't help that this character, Gwen, shares a name with my mother, and it also doesn't help that they were both always puffing away like a fucking chimney. Ugh! This game, however, has at least helped me come to terms with something. Death, loss, it's inevitable. It sucks. None of us want to go through it. I never want to go through it again. But I will, and so will all of you. And it's going to make us feel upset, or angry, or depressed, and that's okay. It's okay to feel this way when someone you love is taken from you. But you also have to remember that there will always be at least one person looking out for you, even in your darkest times. Sometimes without that darkness, we wouldn't be able to see the light. And I know that's corny as all frick, it's basically the plot of Kingdom Hearts and there's that one disturbed song about it, but it's true. Death and loss are an inevitable part of our lives, but we can only grow to be better and stronger people because of it. Whether you're someone helping someone else to deal with a loss they've experienced, or whether you take your own personal experiences of loss to heart and move forward, maybe even somehow carrying on the legacy of that person you lost, or helping their spirit live on. Is that the message Spiritfarer is trying to convey? Maybe, maybe not. Does it do it perfectly? No. Characters can be annoying little chatterboxes when they want to be, and sometimes it gets a little tedious. Is Spiritfarer a perfect game? No. I wish there was a bit more exploring to be done at the game's many locations, considering how snappy the controls are and how awesome double jumping and sliding down slopes feels, and animations for things like harvesting crops look cool the first time, but get pretty irksome after a few dozen more. Do I care? No. Because Spiritfarer is beautiful. I haven't beaten it yet, and it's probably going to take me a little while to get all the way through it, but my experience with it has been eye-opening and has helped me through a very rough time in my life. But even disregarding that, this is the wholesome little management game that I think some people need right now. Whether you play it for small sessions or go all out and get lost in it for hours. Sailing through this spirit world, the quaint sound of the waves crashing against the hull of your ship, fishing up messages in bottles, giving chumby toad friends big hugs. It's just so relaxing, and comfy, and beautiful. And look at this extremely inaccurate depiction of raccoons! I am sick of us being misrepresented as conniving, chunky little crocs! Huh? What do you mean I stole the CinemaSins format way back when? That, that's different, shut the fuck up. As a final word, most of this script was written and recorded around the time where the pandemic was at its global peak, and things have changed a fair bit since then. Some countries, like us down in Australia, and especially our friends over in New Zealand, they've handled it pretty well, and they're slowly transitioning back to getting people outside working and living a relatively normal life, with certain precautions of course. Other countries have attempted to take precautions, but it feels less like making actual progress to quelling the virus, and more like rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. Sadly, it's still a time filled with uncertainty for a lot of us. So to that, all I can say is, take care of yourself, man. Get some well-deserved self-care happening. Sit down and binge some movies. Pick up that hobby you've always wanted to have a crack at. Eat tubs upon tubs of Blue Heaven Aeroplane Jelly, I think I have an addiction, help me. Play that game you've always wanted to sink your teethies into. Knock out that 60-hour RPG. Grind out those dailies in Fortnite or Destiny or Forza or whatever other smelly live service game you play. Play something cute and wholesome, just like I have been. Who gives a shit? Don't feel bad for wasting time in a virtual world. Go and play some video games already. Self-care is important. Did I stutter? As I am in a relationship, I am contractually obligated to shout out my boyfriend. 
No, I'm not. But even if I were, I'd still want to do it anyway. But yeah, uh, Nat, aka Jinji Kun, blessed bean that they are. They stream Destiny 2 and stuff on their Twitch and post highlights on their YouTube channel and they're funny as heck and if you could check them out, you would make them very happy. And you would also make me at least 71% happier too. Links for both their Twitch and YouTube in the description. Vale is back, baby! Or Remy. Uh, I don't know. As of writing this, I still haven't gone through with the name change, so I don't know. But anyway, yeah, we're back, boys. In case you missed it in this very sad video that I don't blame you if you skipped, I've decided I'm not going to be announcing any projects I'm working on anymore at the end of videos because sometimes the release schedule I announce gets jumbled up and some videos get pushed back while others get dropped altogether. So on that front, in terms of the stuff I already have talked about in the past, you guys are going to get the uh, Need for Speed Most Wanted video very soon. It's been like, wh what, when was the last one? Like February or April or something? And also the video for The Last of Us Part 2 I'm probably going to be shelving that for the time being because Nakey Jakey beat me to the punch and basically said everything I had to say about it and also it's been forever anyway so I might do it sometime later. Or I might not. I don't know. Who knows? I don't fucking know. I don't know shit. Apart from that, I'm not going to announce videos here anymore. But if you want to keep up with what I might be working on, you can always follow me on Twitter for live updates and the occasional funny. Or jump on Discord and join the Veil Force, where I often talk about projects that I don't talk about anywhere else. Or Patreon. Um, sometimes I post updates there. I'm slack. Speaking of which, all my patrons deserve a big thank you, including of course, Artyom, Gebnikan, Keto, The Dervinator, A00, Pasta Boy, Isaac Lamp, Dakota Lewis, K, Damian Maxted, Irish Gamer 22, Kirote the Kitsune, Pear Basket, Run Fast There Smith, Foxafile, Ratchet Mania, Alice Whitaker Bartlett, Matt Beaker, Julian Brown, Duncan Austin, Heat Hood Skyet, Sheepy, Waster USA, Leo Alex50, Nathaniel Forrest, Travis Miranda, Nation McGaltile, Johannes Anderson, Philip Elk, Sparky Butterfloof, Lazaro Dave, The Ruby Red Rose, Raindra, I hope I pronounced that right, I should have asked prior, and Laurent LaCroix. Also, Sir Fox and Jazzy. Sorry, I almost forgot you guys, Lamel. I can't understate how much everyone's support has meant to me over the past few months, and I love you guys so fucking much. Anyway, um, before I get all sappy, uh, I'm gonna end it here. Follow me on Twitter, uh, join the Veil Force on Discord, pledge to my Patreon, uh, $5 tier patrons get access to videos, like, uh, what, 24 hours early or something, and, um, yeah, have a good one. For me? Pretty please?